All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Well, today, at long last, I finally got my hands on a Jaguar F-Type, which is a car I've wanted to do a video with for a very long time. This is a car which Jaguar dubbed the spiritual successor to the E-Type. So it's got some pretty big shoes to fill. As always, I'll be asking the question, should you buy one? Well, if you're basing your decision purely on looks, then that's a pretty easy question to answer. Or so I thought. Let me explain. When this car was released back in 2013, a lot of fuss was made about it. They built up a lot of hype, and rightly so. I have to admit I was obsessed with the F-Type. I yearned for one. I genuinely thought it was the prettiest thing ever. I thought Jaguar had knocked it out of the park. I thought they'd really shaken off the Werther's original and carpet slippers image. This was a Jaguar fit for the 21st century. Do you remember that short film that Jaguar made for this car's release? It featured Damien Lewis, I think it was a Ridley Scott production. Anyway, you see a beautiful red convertible F-Type driving through the desert, and I immediately wanted one. I thought to myself, one day I will have one of those cars. Then a few months after that, I finally saw one in the flesh. And, well, I was a bit disappointed to be honest. It's much smaller than I'd imagined. I thought this would be a similar size to a DB9, when in reality it's not much bigger than a TT. It wasn't just the size of it or the proportions that were disappointing, but the rear end, especially on the convertible, just looks a little bit off looks a little bit pinched. It's almost as if it's been made to fit specific dimensions and they've just made do. I also think it's weird how the Jaguar badge lies completely flat on the boot lid, so it can only be seen by passing birds or basketballers. It's a bit weird. Had that been done by any other company, then I'd assume it was there for a reason, but because it's a Jaguar, I can't help but thinking it was a cock-up, an oversight. That all sounds quite negative, which isn't fair, because from most other angles, it's still a very pretty car, this, especially from the front and the side. Right, let's do a quick bypass test. I'm gonna pop it into dynamic mode, where all my gauges go red. The active exhaust system's opened up, and there we go. That sounds so good, you know. In dynamic mode, it holds onto the gears longer. That's properly quick. My little spoiler's popped up in the back too. Okay, better slow down there. This model's the 3 litre supercharged V6S, which produces about 380 horsepower, and it feels fairly brutal actually. To sum up the styling, it is a very pretty car, it's just from some angles, especially in person, it just looks a bit odd. Anyway, that might just be me, styling's always subjective, isn't it? Although I love driving a convertible, the coupe is actually better looking, I think, from the back anyway. The electric roof on this convertible takes just 12 seconds from start to finish, and it can be done at speeds of up to 30 miles an hour, which is quite handy here in Manchester because sometimes the sun's only out for 90 seconds, so you don't want to miss any of it. I also like the flush door handles like you get in an Aston Martin, and I like the central exhaust. It's a cool car, this. In fact, it's very cool Britannia, and not in a sad or desperate way either. It isn't pathetically nostalgic like some cars are. It does actually feel like the spiritual successor to the E-Type. You can imagine if the swinging 60s were to happen again now, this would be the car of choice on Carnaby Street. It's one of those cars that instantly makes you feel cooler than you are. Moving inside the F-Type, it's all very, very driver focused. Everything's kind of angled towards the driver. I love how everything's covered in leather. And I also like this carbon fiber effect trim. It all feels very modern. I also love these central vents which pop up seemingly from nowhere. It's such a man thing that, isn't it, getting excited over such gadgetry. You can imagine showing that to a woman and she'd just be like, yeah, big deal. But show that to a man on the other hand and he's instantly five years old. It's got everything that you'd need though. You get a touch button start, two cup holders, a nice comfortable armrest with storage underneath, a glove compartment, door pockets, more storage behind the seats. You don't really need much more than that. What is slightly disappointing though, the lack of extras is standard. For example, on this one, I've got no heated seats, no heated steering wheel. There's no reverse camera, and to move the seat forward or backwards, you just get this Brunellian handle. I hate when manufacturers are so mean and stingy with options. Weirdly, you get this grab handle here, a bit like the one you'd find on the side of Thora Herd's bathtub. I don't really see the point of that. The infotainment system is the same semi-touchscreen system that you'd find in all Jaguar Land Rovers of this era. It's the same as my first L405, and it's all quite easy to use and operate. This is a 2014 car, so some of the buttons and switches are showing their age slightly. Things like the start-stop button are starting to wear, but you can replace those quite easily. As nice as the interior is, the overall quality just doesn't feel as high as the Porsche Boxster I filmed with recently, which was eight years older than this. 
but somehow the Jaguar feels more more fun, more light-hearted. The Porsche is very clinical and sensible, whereas this feels a bit more game for a laugh. The sound system is provided by Meridian, which is typically very good. What else can I tell you? The seats are very comfortable. It's only a two-seater, the F-Type, which is probably a good thing. But if they try and jam two little seats in the back, they're only really suitable for anyone with the abilities of Alex Mack. The driving position is very good. You can sit down nice and low. You can adjust the steering wheel, both up, down, in and out. The visibility is very good. And you get this clever blind spot monitoring system, which is one of those modern car features that I just couldn't live without. The boot isn't very spacious, as you might expect. In fact, it's as shallow as a cheerleader. It actually looks smaller than the Boxster I filmed with recently. And unlike the Boxster, there isn't an additional boot up front. That's because all of the space up front is taken up by the Jaguar F-Type's main selling point. The engine. There are quite a few engine options to choose from, and all of them are mouth-watering. The base model gets a 3-litre supercharged V6 with 340 horsepower. If you go for an S model like this, you get 380. Or they do a 5-litre V8S with 495 horsepower. Or they do the V8R with 550 horsepower. 550 horsepower in a car which weighs about as much as my shoes must feel demonic because this 380 horsepower S is plenty quick enough. You really don't need much more than the V6S. This will do 0 to 60 in 4.8 seconds and keep going past 170 miles an hour. And it's not as if the V6 sounds bad, in fact quite the opposite. The V8 sounds good too, but I don't know if it's better, it's just different. All of the models apart from the base V6 get a limited slip diff and an active exhaust system. All you need to do is press this little button down here, which looks like a pair of binoculars, and then instantly, it becomes much more throaty. There are some limited edition models too, such as the Project 8, or there's an SVR with 575 horsepower and all-wheel drive. The rest, like this one, aren't, they're rear-wheel drive, which does make this a bit more fun, a bit more slippery. Most of them are fitted with an 8-speed quick-shift automatic gearbox, which is excellent. It isn't a fiddly complicated twin clutch job, it's just a standard auto, but it does its job about as good as any conventional auto can. You get the same joystick gear lever you'll find in a Range Rover Sport, which I actually really like. I wish my full-size Range Rover had a gear lever like this, it's just much more intuitive. In terms of running costs, the 3-litre V6 will do about 30 miles per gallon on average, and the road tax here in the UK is only £360 a year. The V8s will average about 25 26 and the road tax shoots up to 6 30 but the V8 manages to shave off about a second on its 0 to 60 sprint. If you want to drive a car like this, then those running costs shouldn't come as a surprise. Anything in this category will have similar costs attached. In my opinion, those costs are worth paying because it's such a joy to drive this. It's a really special car, and it makes you feel special. It's so responsive, both the throttle and the steering. It's just a fun car to drive, whether you're pootling around town or really hammering it. I've been really surprised by the ride quality. I thought this would be overly firm. I thought it'd feel like a shopping trolley on a cobbled street, but it doesn't. Don't get me wrong, it's not a Jaguar XJ, but it isn't bad. I thought this would be one of those cars that'd make you wince when you drive over a manhole cover, but it really doesn't. I'm not sure I'd want to drive it every single day, but certainly as a weekend car, it'd be great fun. There's also not much road noise, especially for a convertible sports car with a fabric top. I think that's helped by the fact that this fabric top's got more layers than an onion. It'll be difficult for you to get an accurate opinion of the road noise because this microphone is very sensitive. I don't have a decibel lometer on me, but I can say it feels quieter than my AMG GT or a 911. In terms of servicing costs, then I imagine this will be on par with something like a Porsche Boxster. Jaguar actually do fixed price servicing on older cars, so that might be worth looking into. I'd make sure that you service it every 10,000 miles or every 12 months, whichever comes first. And I'd treat it to premium fuel. It'll just keep everything running nice and cleanly. Reliability-wise, unfortunately, it's a Jaguar Land Rover product, so no doubt you'll be plagued. I don't mean plagued by issues, by the way. I mean plagued by Noels, whose second cousin's neighbour had one and had nothing but trouble with it. It's always how it goes, isn't it? Weirdly, though, those same people never tell you about the recall on the Toyota GT86 that, if you don't get it done, can destroy the engine. They never mention that. Funny, isn't it? And yet they always have an anecdote about Jaguar Land Rovers. Weird. I don't want to come across as arrogant now, but I know cars fairly well. I bought and sold thousands of them, literally thousands of them. So would I have one? Would I spend my own money on a Jaguar product or a Land Rover product? Yes, absolutely. I have done. I do. I run a Range Rover. When probably maintained and looked after, they're no worse than anything else on the roads. So ignore all the naysayers who've never had one. 
Used prices here in the UK start around £25,000, but to get a nice low mileage example, you'll have to spend around 30. All right, the build quality isn't on par with something like a Porsche, but somehow this feels more special. And I guarantee it'll put a smile on your face every single time you drive it. To answer my question I posed at the start, should you buy one? Yeah, I think so. It's not perfect, but no car is. Personally though, I prefer its bigger, older brother, the Jaguar XKR. That, to me, is the actual spiritual successor to the E-Type, not this. I really don't know why Jaguar didn't make a new XK, kind of based on this, but a little bit bigger. Anyway, I can't really answer that. So I think that's about it. Thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll leave the link below. If you've got any comments or questions, let me know below, and I'll do my best to get back to you. So yeah, cheers guys. See you next time.